Hello everyone, I'm Mike Kenny, the Chief Scientific Officer at Carthera, and today I'm going to be talking about a clinical trial that we've recently completed a blood-brain barrier opening with the SonoCloud 9 implantable ultrasound device in recurrent glioblastoma patients receiving IV carboplatin. So we've known for several decades that low-intensity pulsed ultrasound can be used to transiently disrupt the blood-brain barrier when it's administered in combination with an intravenous infusion of microbubbles. This effect is reversible, it lasts for several hours, and it can actually be used to increase the brain concentrations of a, quite a wide range of therapies from small molecule to large molecule uh, drugs on the order of five to 10 fold. The device that we've developed is an implantable device, and we've called it the SodaCloud 9 here, and it's actually an extension of a first generation device, the SodaCloud 1 that we developed uh, and tested in our first pilot clinical trials. So the SodaCloud 9, has nine one megahertz ultrasound emitters that are arranged on this grid and attached to a titanium mesh. To implant the device, uh, uh, which is usually done at the end of a surgical uh, resection or debulking procedure, um, usually the dura mater is first closed and then the device is actually replaces the bone flap. At the end of the surgical uh, procedure, the skin is closed and then the patient has the first activation of the device several weeks after the surgery. To activate the device, a transdermal needle can be plugged through the skin and into the device. And this actually powers the device when it's connected to an external interface or power supply that's shown here. In this trial that I'm gonna to present today, we actually activated the device on demand every four weeks. And when we activate the device, uh, we turn it on for four and a half minutes and apply ultrasound in combination with an IV infusion of microbubbles. Here we use Definity microbubbles. Um, and after that, we can actually disrupt the blood brain barrier over quite a large uh, brain volume of about six by six by six cubic centimeters. So the target population for our clinical trial I'm gonna talk about today is recurrent glioblastoma. And in recurrent glioblastoma, uh, uh, typically, uh, the standard of care is to do additional surgery and or chemotherapy at recurrence. Uh, the median overall survival remains poor in this population, less than 12 months. And for example, for the standard of care, which is lomastine that's commonly given in these patients, they typically progress very quickly after say one and a half months. So this is an overview of the clinical trial that we performed. It was a multi-center, open-label, first-in-human, phase one, two clinical trial performed in United States and France using low intensity pulsed ultrasound blood brain barrier opening with the SonoCloud 9 system with carboplatin in recurrent GBM patients who are eligible for surgery. And the main endpoints of the trial first were safety and afterward clinical and radiological efficacy. For some of the key inclusion criteria, just to mention here, uh, we choose patients that had histologically proven recurrent de novo GBM. Uh, they had maximal tumor diameter at inclusion of less than 70 millimeters uh, on T1-weighted uh, contrast-enhanced MRI. And it, of course, they were eligible for surgical resection. And the trial was designed as a phase one, two trial in, in, in which we had a dose escalation. Here, the dose was really the, the amount of ultrasound that we applied. So here in the first group of patients, we applied three emitters, then we applied six emitters, then we applied nine emitters to slowly increase the volume of BBB disruption and show that that was safe. Um, in the expansion phase, uh, which I'll talk more about some of the results in this talk, um, first we had an expansion phase in cohort C with nine emitters. And in these patients, the first uh, thing that we looked at actually was to perform an MRI immediately after the sonication to verify the safety of the procedure. And then the patients went on to get chemotherapy, in this case, carboplatin uh, chemotherapy at AUC5. After we finished this cohort, we actually added an additional cohort of patients, cohort D, that had all nine emitters activated. But in this case, we actually gave carboplatin just before the sonication. So the carboplatin was infused, and then we sonicated right at the end of the carboplatin infusion. So these are the baseline characteristics of the patients that were included in the different groups. And here I'm really gonna be focused on the two cohorts that had all nine emitters activated, cohort C and cohort D. Here we see very little differences in terms of the baseline characteristics of these patients. The only thing to note is that we had a slightly higher proportion of unmethylated patients and they were also slightly younger in cohort D. 
But overall, we performed 90 sonications in 33 patients among all of these different cohorts. As far as safety, this is an overview of the safety that we observed uh, across all of these patients. We didn't observe any dose limiting toxicity as we escalated from three to six to nine emitters. In terms of higher grade procedure related adverse events, we had a few that were prim primarily related to the surgical procedure that were difficult to distinguish from just the, the normal uh, resection procedure that the patient would undergo. In addition, we had some transient adverse events that occurred during sonications that typically resolve very quickly after the sonication within 30 minutes to 60 minutes after the sonication. And we didn't observe any long-term adverse events of repeated sonications of up to 10 months of treatment. So as an example of the, of the volume of BBB disruption that we observed in a few patients, um, these are MRIs actually taken uh, on the left in each case is an MRI taken one to two days before the sonication procedure. In some cases, for example, on patient A, you can see some residual T1 enhancement that was left after the surgery. And on the image on the right, you can see an image uh, of actually the region of, of blood brain barrier that we actually disrupted using the Sonocloud 9 in each case. So here we see under each of those nine beams, we see very clearly uh, an increase in gadolinium enhancement that's used to really map out uh, the region of blood brain barrier disruption. And overall, we observed a medium depth of BBB opening of up to six, just over six centimeters, and 90% of the activated emitters led to good uh, repeatability, good BBB opening. In addition to looking at the efficacy of BBB disruption, we also did a small uh, uh, study with Northwestern and a few patients in which we actually sampled drug concentrations uh, in the operating room. So in this case, just to describe the procedure, we actually placed the uh, Sonocloud 9 at the beginning here of the resection procedure directly on the brain. And what we did was we sonicated uh, using the Sonocloud 9 uh, with the full brain intact before the resection procedure. Then we use fluorescein to actually map out the regions of blood brain barrier disruption. And we infuse carboplatin at a lower dose here at AC 3.5, which is slightly lower than the dose that we use during uh, uh, normal treatments in the clinical trial. So we did this procedure in three patients. And actually what we found when we took uh, targeted biopsies from each of these regions of either disrupted uh, blood brain barrier or intact blood brain barrier. And these were all in regions that were actually outside of the tumors. These are peritumoral regions. We know that this is the region that's most likely to recur for, for, for tumor recurrence. And so we're trying to get drug really into these regions to prevent tumor recurrence. And so in these regions with carboplatin, we actually saw almost a six fold uh, enhancement in carboplatin levels. Uh, in the peritumoral region after sonication. And these, again, these biopsies were taken at 45 minutes after sonication. These results agreed very well with what we saw previously in a mouse in a primate model, where we saw really a four to seven fold enhancement in drug concentrations after sonication. So in terms of tumor control, we did an analysis actually looking at how the T1 weighted changes uh, evolved over time in each of these patients. So we actually did a monthly MRI, both pre and post sonication in these patients. So we had quite a few MRIs to track uh, how the T1 evolution occurred. And on the left, you can just see here, I'm just gonna be talking about the Sonocloud 9 treatment volume as if we assume kind of a, a, a volume with a, with, a, with a diffusion margin around it of five millimeters extending from each of the beams. And we actually look at how the T1 of walls after surgery with each uh, monthly treatment. Um, and so in the middle, we can actually see curves for each of these patients in which uh, we give carboplatin in cohort C uh, either after sonication. And these patients, I should just say again, these patients went to the MRI and then they went to the infusion suite. So they typically went on carboplatin uh, about an hour after sonication and then completed the carboplatin infusion anywhere from 90 minutes to two hours after the sonication. In cohort D or carbo D here, we actually um, gave carboplatin just before the sonication, as I said, and then sonicated right when the plasma levels were the highest. And so these were these sonications occurred at the peak plasma levels of the drug. And the interesting thing that we saw is actually we saw a delayed tumor growth or maybe a slower evolution in T1-weighted changes overall. So that's what we see in the figure on the right here is between these two different cohorts, we saw basically slower tumor growth 
uh, or slower T1 weighted changes over time when carboplatin was given just before ultrasound instead of having this delay between sonication and the carboplatin infusion. The interesting thing is that when we actually looked at T1-weighted changes outside of this implant ROI, uh, so that would be in the whole brain, just outside of out, excluding this whole uh, sonication volume, we didn't see a statistically different uh, uh, change in, in, in T1-weighted changes over time. So in addition to these improved radiological outcomes, we also saw an improvement in clinical outcomes between these two cohorts. So these are the final numbers that we saw um, overall in terms of three month uh, PFS, the median PFS, nine month OS and the one year OS. So in, in patients receiving carboplatin before sonication, they had a trend for really improved PFS and OS. And so here we saw, we observed a one year OS of 58%. We're still waiting on the median OS, which we hope to report in, in a few months. Um, but overall, these were very encouraging results in a patient population where the one-year OS is typically less than 40%. So in conclusion, the SonoCloud 9 plus carboplatin treatments were well tolerated. Uh, the sonication procedure is easy to perform. It's a 10-minute procedure to do the activation. And here we did the activation again monthly every four weeks until progression. So these patients had several cycles of sonication up to six in this clinical protocol. Uh, the VVB can be opened repeatedly over a large volume. And here with carboplatin, we saw an increase in drug concentration of 5.9 fold uh, when we actually measured it in, in, in a subset of patients who got intraoperative sonications and drug infusion. We also observed that optimal administration or sonication really right at the time of, of uh, infusion of drug really right at the time of sonication led to improved radiological and clinical outcomes in this small in these small cohorts of patients. And now we're in the process of, of planning a randomized pivotal trial of this approach. So I just want to acknowledge all the different clinical sites in the US and France who participated um, and our funding sources. Thank you so much for your time.